السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم It is such an honor to be with you on this evening. I uh, I was actually supposed to be with you about a year ago and had to cancel at the very last minute. So I am apologizing for that uh, one year late. The reason I couldn't come last year is because I got a phone call the day before when I was here speaking uh, in Southern California that my son had been taken to the ICU. He's 14 years old. And I, I want to share this with you because it reminded me, being here one year later, Alhamdulillah, he's healthy and fine, that Allah sends us so many messages in so many ways to teach us lessons about gratitude, about sacrifice, and about finding meaning in every experience. And I feel that being here with you is a reminder that there is ease after hardship. And there is meaning in difficulty. And I thought that what might be useful tonight, <clears throat> since I'm not a scholar like Imam Soheib Webb and I'm not a poet like Emin, is for me to share with you some of my experiences and, and share what I learned from, from my life so far. I was asked today to not focus on my research because it's too dry, but to tell you a little bit more about my personal journey. So what I thought would be useful is to share a few of the, the, the lessons that I've gained in, in going through uh, what, what has always been an interesting journey. And I thought maybe this is, uh, that the way I would structure this talk is almost as a, what, what, are the, what are the things I would tell myself, my 20 year old self? What, what are the, the, the lessons that I wish I had known or the, the pieces of advice that I wish someone had told me at that time? And this is for all the young people who are facing so many unprecedented challenges today. Because I wish I was here talking to you in a time of ease, in a time of comfort for our community. But that's not where we are today. So I'm not here to tell you everything's okay, because everything is not okay in our country today. Things are far from okay. We are at a critical point in our history. Things are being said that are almost unprecedented. But I'm not here also to tell you all that we are a community of victims, because we're not. The kind of bigotry and Islamophobia that you are experiencing are a symptom of a deeper and more serious disease that hurts all people. And that cancer of racism should not make us feel like victims, but rather as people with responsibilities as servant leaders who have to lead and cure and heal our country. The message I have for you today is not one of victimization. It is one of servant leadership. And the reason we have to be these kinds of leaders is because our country 
is in a vulnerable and dire state. These things weaken everything and everyone and the very foundation of our country's democracy. And it is up to all of us as believers to stand up for truth and justice, not to save ourselves, but to save our entire country because it is a danger against every single American, not just one community. And so for, for those who will take up this, this important mantle, this important responsibility, here is what I offer from my experience. Never underestimate the power of being in the room. I often have young people tell me, I've been invited to uh, serve on this committee, or I've been invited to join this council, and I know that they're only inviting me as the token X the token woman, the token Muslim, the token brown person, the token black person. So I'm not really sure I want to do it because I'm being invited for the wrong reasons. And every single one of these young people, I tell them, God puts you there, not who's inviting you, and it's because it's the right reason. Don't ever underestimate the power of being in the room. Just your very presence at that table, with your voice, with your existence, will at least do one thing. If you don't even open your mouth, you know what you'll do? You'll make people feel uncomfortable when that person starts to spew their bigoted remarks. If you're not in the room, no one's gonna feel uncomfortable. It's going to be okay. And that's if you don't open your mouth. Being in the room means that you have an opportunity to speak your truth. If you're not in that room because the, the invitation didn't come in the right font, in the right color, in the right way, then you're making it about yourself and not about a mission that you have. I've been invited to join committees where I am literally told that I'm the token. And I still join them because I have a choice whether or not to behave like a token. And I know that that opportunity is not coming to me through that person for those reasons. And that this entire theater we are watching is controlled by a different director. So don't ever underestimate the power of being in the room. Don't turn on these opportunities, ever. But be in that room for the right reasons. And it's not about you. That's the second thing that I want to tell my younger self and all the young people here. It's never about you. When it becomes about you, you will feel so weak so insecure. It is not about you, and so do what is uncomfortable to you. Do what you're afraid of. Push yourself to stand and speak and be strong because you're not representing yourself. It's there, you're there to serve a higher cause than, than yourself. That night last year, I got that phone call at four o'clock in the afternoon. I couldn't get a plane out until around midnight. And I had to do a talk in front of 800 people that night. And I did it. And I got a standing ovation. 
And it wasn't because I was good at public speaking. And it wasn't because I wasn't worried about my son. It was because I told myself in that moment, this is not about you. You're here to deliver a message that has nothing to do with you. And then I felt strong. When it becomes about me, I, I feel like I lose my voice completely. The third thing I want to convey is for us to commit to our mission and not the means. Here's what I mean by that. I used to be the executive director of Muslim Studies at Gallup. And I, I started the Center for Muslim Studies there. It was, uh, it was a project that I committed to, I, I invested in, I worked hundreds of hours a month on, and it almost like became my identity. And then one day, the company wanted to close my center. And I felt this sense of panic, like I really had to fight to, to keep what was mine, what I had built. And then in, in a conversation with my friend, you know, she asked me, why, why is this so important to you? Why are you going to battle for this center? Why is it like you're, 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 you're attached so much to this thing? You don't think you're able to serve God in some other way? And so finally, at the point when there was no other choice, I didn't lose myself because I realized that I had to commit to my mission and not to the means. Allah had given me that vehicle at that time to serve him. And when it was time for me to change that vehicle, I had to let go. And I think this is really important, especially for anyone working in the community or in, in public service or in, in mosque work. Because I travel the country and in so many places, I see incredible hardship in communities because people are so attached to the means that they forget the mission. <coughs> they are the founders of a, of a masjid and they can't let go of their board spot. And there are lawsuits all over our country Muslim against Muslim because of some small little, to me, insignificant issue around who should, you know, who should stay on the board and who should leave. Where you really wonder, are you committed? Are you really committed to serving God or to the means of serving God, which is that board position? I think this one problem of being more attached to the means than the mission explains the majority of our problems in our Islamic centers. If we can let go of the means and understand that serving God can take all different kinds of form and not make this institution, this project, an extension of our identity as I had done, we would reduce the, the, the conflict and increase the compassion in our community. Because when Allah took away one thing, he gave me some other means. But I wouldn't have been able to do that had I not let go. Had, had I not psychologically understood that this, this closing of one door wasn't a, a defeat in my heart, but was rather a chapter that was closing and a new one opening. It was just a different way of looking at it because it could have really destroyed me as attached as I was to this project. The next thing is that consider opportunities a test from God, just like hardships. And so approach them by studying hard. And I wanna share this with you because I think it's important to understand 
how much hard work goes into things. So, how many people saw the video of when I was on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah? Has anyone seen that? Okay, a few of you, thank you. So that's, you know, my long life, my, my life's long, long dream is, is to be on the, on the Daily Show. Ever since he, John Stewart was there, this was when I, my book came out, that was what I always wanted, right? I, I tried, I mean, I had no connection to them, but it was sort of like, wouldn't it be cool if I could ever go on that and talk about Islam? So one day, um, last year, actually in, uh, in December, I got a call from absolutely nowhere. I have no agent. This was not like some, somebody hooked me up. Just literally out of nowhere, I got a call, and it was The Daily Show. They said, you know, we'd like you to come and uh, talk about all this craziness that's going on with, with all the anti-Muslim rhetoric. It was like insane, just like dropped out of the sky. And uh, of course I, you know, of course the answer is yes. But then a complete terror and panic struck my heart because I was completely unprepared. Um, it's not my comfort zone. I'm, I'm only funny in private. And I felt like I can think of at least 10 other people that would represent better in that environment. But I was the one that was being given this opportunity. So I had to figure out what to do. And so I actually got help. I, I know this uh, wonderful comedy and speech coach. She actually lives right here in Southern California that I met at a conference. Her name is Judy Carter. And I called Judy and I said, I need your help. And we worked for hours and hours preparing for that interview. That didn't just happen. And we practiced different questions. She kind of knew what was gonna happen. We went through it and went through it and went through it. And as terrifying as it was, I was waiting backstage, waiting to be announced. My hand was literally un uncontrollably shaking. I got on there and I was able to perform. Alhamdulillah. Right? So he even did, you know, extended it to a longer uh, interview. It was supposed to be five minutes. It ended up being 14 minutes. And there's a, an extended sort of online uh, continuation of it. Why I want to mention that is the importance of not doing things by yourself. Not, and not thinking anyone does anything alone. You have to reach out to people that can help you. You have to get training when you're not comfortable doing something. Or even if you think you're comfortable, find the best person you can who knows how to do something and ask for their help. There is no shame in this kind of, uh, in this kind of uh, sort of awareness of where you're strong and where you're weak. When you get an opportunity, know immediately that God is testing you. They're not, I, I never think of anything that happens as a reward, basically. I'm always like, okay, what am I supposed to learn from this? Even if it seems like a wonderful thing. Same with hardships. Every single thing is a test. So study hard. And then finally, and I'll end with this. I, I say this and sometimes I get misunderstood, so I'm gonna to try to be as clear as I can. It is about, in your life, it is about obedience and not outcomes. What do I mean by that? I mean that when we become attached to the outcome of our actions, meaning, I want to grow this program. I want to build this institution. And it, it, it's very natural to be focused on the outcome. But I'm actually challenging you 
to not attach yourself to the outcome and instead commit yourself to the obedience of God. To connect, to, to commit to only obeying and not the outcomes will liberate you and improve your work and I promise improve your outcomes. The minute that we define success the way we do in the secular world, the way we understand in the corporate world, which is where I'm from, and this is where I've had to learn this, to unlearn this, this, this concept of not defining success with outcomes, but defining success with how well did I go through this process in terms of obeying God. You will be amazed at the feeling of liberation and empowerment. Because guess what? You have total control over your obedience. And you have exactly zero control over the outcomes. Exactly zero control. Don't feel any sense of pride if it goes well. And don't feel depressed when it doesn't. The only thing to really judge yourself on is how well you obeyed. And this is especially for activists. Because I've seen so many activists either get burned out because the outcomes sometimes don't work out, or I've seen them actually hurt other people, com uh, compete with each other in a, in a very unhealthy way because the outcomes are all they see. I think it explains so much of the, the discord that you sometimes see in communities. People more committed to outcomes than, than obedience. So if there's, almost, if there's nothing else that you remember from what I said today, I hope it's just this. In our work, in our service to God, the more that we can detach from the outcomes and commit to the obedience, the better we will actually serve and the better our outcomes will actually be while maintaining the brotherhood that we desperately need to bring about the kind of moral leadership that our community and our country is desperately calling for. Thank you.